to share space. Um, my name is John Washington. I'm an organizer with People's Action. Uh, People's Action is a national network of organizations in over 35 states uh, that are working on a long-term agenda uh, for racial, economic, ecological, every form of justice, uh, work with all kinds of organizations. And I'm one of the folks on our Homes Guarantee team, uh, which is running a national campaign uh, for social housing. And our, our ultimate goal is to guarantee a home uh, and not just a home, but a quality, sustainable, affordable home, hopefully with some equity in it uh, for every person in the United States of America. Uh, there are several countries in the world right now in Europe that are that are doing the social housing, have been doing it for 10, 15 years. And we believe absolutely that the only thing stopping that the richest country in the history of the world from housing every person um, is the political will. Uh, and, and really is on us to, to figure out um, how we can strategically move um, our, our federal government and all of our local governments um, toward, toward social housing. And we believe it's important to have a national campaign that is a collection of local campaigns because of how many different forms of government actually control each building that we live in. And I will dig into that a little bit more uh, later. Um, I, I used to be the organizing director at Push Buffalo. Um, so I worked on the ground in Buffalo, New York, which is not too much different from Cincinnati, although there are definite differences and took a few trips to there in Cleveland and um, really did work a lot on building affordable housing, uh, working on community benefits with banks, uh, working on building um, a weatherization program, uh, which has been one of the most successful in the nation, uh, worked on building community shared solar. In fact, PUSH became um, under our time a a utility itself so that we could redistribute power from a shared solar array, the first of which uh, happened in New York State. So, um, you know, was able to, to do a lot of great work on the ground at Push Buffalo, uh, but ultimately came to the conclusion that, that some of these problems really need national solutions and we need to figure out at a national scale how to bring and lift up community solutions uh, with national strategy. And, and that's what I've been doing here for, for the past year with People's Action. So really excited to, to be sharing space with you uh, and would love it if all of you could could introduce yourself quickly and if you could share your name uh, if you have any um, preferred pronouns um, and uh, if you could just share a little bit of what you're looking to get out of the time that we're going to spend together today all right well I can I can start uh, I'm Mary Metzmeyer and I use she her pronouns and um, what I'm really looking to get out of tonight is an idea of the national picture. Um, and then I'm hoping that we, when we meet at our next housing meeting, we can take some of these pieces and figure out how we do work them locally. Great, you wanna pass it off to someone? I will pass it to Lenore. Oh, it's funny, I knew that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm looking for pretty much the same thing, a way forward, because it's ridiculous that we're so rich and we have this situation in housing. And, you know, I equated to that horrible thing that was just on the news this evening about all of these children who cannot be connected with their parents. It's heartbreaking. It's insane that, that we're in this situation. Oh, well, I could get pretty emotional over this. <laughs> and would you mind passing it to someone else? Yeah, Andrea. Uh, my name is Andrea Baker. <clears throat> I'm on the call because I'm interested in housing, period. How we can help communities. Um, in the community where I live, we have a lot of empty space. And so we're trying to figure out how to get housing in that space, but make it so that people can have some type of ownership to feel like they are part of that housing and it not be a project. Sounds, sounds good to me. Uh, you wanna pass it on to one of your other colleagues? Uh, Allison. Um, I'm Allison. I am uh, a staff organizer at Communities United for Action. 
I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I think, you know, just watching all of this investment happen um, here locally on housing and to find that most of it that's being developed isn't really affordable or accessible for, for regular working people. Um, it's become really frustrating. So, and the more I just like learn about our local policies here and our policies on the federal level, you know, um, I'm interested in learning how to sort of, how to tackle locally and nationally the institutionalized racism that has made housing inaccessible for everyone. And I will pass it to Nina. I guess it's not on my face at the moment, but um, Nina Caporell, uh, my interest here is to kind of learn how to get started. Um, I of course have a personal story about my own housing insecurity issues, but I see housing insecurity in general as being one of the most universal problems throughout the US. And um, uh, this, aside from a basic income guarantee, I think it's one of the most powerful steps we can make towards uh, closing the wealth gap. And um, I will pass to Dorothy. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, housing committee uh, at CUFA and a board member of the South Fairmount uh, Community Council. Um, she, her pro pronouns. And if I could say that I have a dream for housing in this country, it would be that no one be without a home. And that perhaps on some kind of national level that we could do some kind of program like the way I got my house, which was through what they were calling at the time an urban housing program where uh, there was a certain amount of sweat equity uh, involved and um, it creates more stable neighborhoods. And I don't know who else is on. I'm then, on, Irene. Irene, you go next then. Yeah, I'm on. Good evening, everybody. Anyway, uh, what's the question? Because I don't know. <laughs> you could just introduce yourself and just say why, what you'd like to get out of today's session. Okay, uh, I'm Irene Riley. You probably can't see me. I have an issue. I don't want to go into that. But uh, I'm Irene Riley. And I guess I want to, I want to know... Uh, actually how one goes about getting a house. There's so many different programs available, but no one says anything about them unless you hear about them uh, on the news about the landlords. And um, I'm kind of interested in that. You know, why, why landlords don't take care of their property when they have people that are paying and, you know, the issues. Absolutely. Anyone who hasn't introduced themselves yet? I can or, go. Yeah. Oh, no. Hi, uh, so I'm Noelle Beyer, the president and founder of Neighborhood Allies. Um, we help people connect to the resources in the community via knowledge, motivation, transportation, and support. So the resources could be benefit applications, it could be a ride to the food pantry, it could be help navigating a court system, um, and definitely navigating that housing issue. Um, I'm also a part of a few different uh, civic organizations and community movements that are working on housing stuff right now. Um, and so I think that it was relevant to sort of hear what anyone else is doing in that front 
as well as bring any of the knowledge that I might have gained through my participation in the different, um, you know, meetings and things like that, uh, so that I can hopefully help all of us, right, work towards what's going to be the best for the people, because that's where my heart is. I provide direct services. I currently know people who are trickled up with four generations and a three bedroom slab house. And I see what those little seven, eight, nine, ten year olds are going through, what grandpa's going through, what the mom, just, just, just all of it, the sister, the, the everybody is going through. And, you know, I've also helped many people through those applications be it for you know mortgage assistance or subsidized housing things or this or that and there's just so many complexities even to you know just uh regular market rent rate rental stuff um so i really like to try to bring the voice of that realistic experience of what people are going through when they're actually trying to talk to a landlord look at a property, fill out an application, you know, navigate even if it's, if it's, if it's HUD or, um, um, Habitat for Humanity or, or even people working cooperatively, all great places and organizations that help a lot. But sometimes there's these like barriers that really make it difficult for people to connect to. And so I just really, um, yeah, I just want to, I want to learn and I want to advocate, um, and bring everyone together basically to work toward a common goal. Sounds good. Well, we're going to dig into all of that. I uh, just want to make some space for a couple more people to introduce themselves, and we're going to dig right in. My name is Clark Beck, uh, he and him. I'm a member of Communities United for Action here in Cincinnati. And John, I think your introduction really covered everything that I would be interested in tonight. Housing inequality, income inequality in the greatest nation, one of the probably the richest nation in the world and why. We have we have such disparity between people that live here. So I'm I'm interested to hear what you have to say this evening. And thanks for sharing with us. Yeah, great. Is there anyone who didn't get a chance to introduce themselves? Hey, I'm my elder Donnell. I'm a board member member at Kufa, and uh, I was invited to join in tonight. And I'm interested in everything that's been said thus far. Okay. <laughs> Great. Anyone else who I'll didn't introduce get a chance? Myself. Okay. Um, cool. This is Connie Hollins, and I'm a member of KUFA. Um, also, I'm a member of the Real Estate Investors Association here in Cincinnati, and I've been a real estate investor. Um, since you were on this platform with KUFA, I wanted to find out what exactly um, you're going to talk about, about housing. So that's why I thought, let me join in. And I prefer she or her pronouns. Great. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I want to really appreciate everyone sharing with me. It's really helpful for me as a trainer um, to get a sense of what people are want to get out of this, because uh, I don't want to just sit up here talking. I have some things to say, but those things really the purpose of them is to help you all clarify your vision about how you build out your housing work. And for me, um, the number one thing that we kind of forget sometimes in organizing um, is, is to strive for clarity. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of folks, a lot of energy around a lot of issues. And one of the biggest things that I think that that especially with this four years of Trump that we went through, that is so important to our organizing work is building the clarity about our purpose and what we're doing, how we're using our time efficiently, and how we're working to build a base of people um, as we're working to understand the technical issues. Uh, one of the, the, the ma major shifts that neoliberalism has brought um, to our world is, is the replacement of brutality with complexity. Uh, so where 
folks used to get beaten in the streets and they didn't want you to vote. You know, they were going to physically keep you from voting. Uh, now we see uh, the ownership of, of the machines and, and the whole process and the way that um, confusing people is has been the, the new model of how oppression um, really permeates most of our communities. Uh, and that's a lot harder to deal with and clarify sometimes than, than the physical oppression um, that, that we saw in the you know, 60s and 70s. And I think that's the arc that we're moving to especially with technology and so i think it's so important to understand how the housing system works as a process um, so that you can figure out what are the leverage points that are, that are in the process as opposed to trying to solve the whole problem at once uh, because we know that you know we have we have a lot of power as individuals uh, but we often do not have the level of staff and financing that some of the people that we're organizing against do um, and so i operate at a framework that most of our, our behavior, the way that we show up, comes out of our head, our heart, and our guts, right? Um, and so before we dig into the head work that I know so many people are really interested in, I want us to really get into our hearts and our guts um, and think about these things through our self-interest. Um, and I'm, hopefully y'all do have some conversations in your organizing about self-interest, but for those who aren't familiar with the term, you know, self-interest is really about, you know, how we relate to each other, how we see in each other a vision for leadership um, that acknowledges some of the oppression that we've dealt with, um, allows each other to understand what we've all been through so that we understand what we're fighting for. Um, because while policies, names, words, elected officials, targeting, all of those things are incredibly important. Um, without clarity about why we're doing the work and what we're trying to accomplish and, and where those feelings come from, uh, it's so easy to get lost in the complexity of how cities, counties, the federal government can just throw all this stuff at us um, and many of the ways we can get caught in trap doors that they've set up for us to go down these rabbit holes that really have very little to do with the people in our communities. Uh, so I wanna start with um, a housing stories exercise. Every single one of us has a housing story. Some of them are very simple. The most privileged of us can say, hey, I grew up in a house with my parents. I moved out, lived in the house for my entire life. I don't know how many people that can say that. Uh, and then there are some of us, uh, like myself, I've, I've lived in over 70 different apartments uh, over the course of my life for, for various reasons. Uh, so I want everyone to take a moment uh, and really reflect on all of the places that you've lived in your life um, why you moved there, why you left. And really, if you were to tell your life as a story through the homes you've lived in, what story would that tell? Um, and to me, you know, every one of you is here for a reason. You care about housing, either because you have an experience or because you observed an experience. And we wanna constantly remind ourselves of our experience and our pain and our trauma and the ways in which this, this system um, has, has harmed us, or even if we haven't been harmed, how we've observed over the course of our lives, how other people have, and the dissonance it creates when you say, wait a minute, I, I didn't have to go through that. I didn't have to deal with that. Why, why are these other people having to deal with these situations? Um, so again, if everybody can just, just be kind of uh, thinking about where you've lived, um, why you moved, what were those communities like? Um, and then well, we're gonna split everyone up into a pair and we're gonna have folks spend five minutes each just sharing your housing story with a partner. Um, and then we'll come back and, and debrief and, and, and hear back, uh, share back out some of what folks have learned. Of course, if, if people are vulnerable and, and sharing stories that, that they don't want shared with the entire group, um, you know, it's always good to, to leave some of those things out, but just to summarize uh, some of the ways that, that folks have connected while we do this exercise. Um, so is, is that clear to everyone what's gonna happen? Anybody totally confused right now? Cool, all right, well, let's give, give um, us a moment to kind of split everybody up and then you'll be sent into a room with another person. Um, and then, you know, pick one person to kind of start sharing out some of the homes you've lived in, some of the places you have. Wish we had a little bit more time um, to do this, but uh, you know, uh, we're gonna deal with, with what we have. So um, if we could start and the so process of kind of splitting folks up. John, if it's okay, if um, for anybody that's watching on Facebook, we'll um, not see anything while the breakouts are going on, um, but we'll be back. 
And so for people who are on Zoom, uh, just so you're clear what's going to happen, this is kind of like magic. It's my very favorite thing about Zoom. So you will have a couple minutes of nothing, and then you will wind up on a screen with, do, did you just want to do pairs, John? Just two people if possible. Okay, so you'll person wind up on a screen with one more person. And then when we're ready to come back, you'll get like a one minute warning. So you should wrap, up, wrap it up. You'll see it on your screen and then you'll come back to the big group. Okay, does that make sense? And for those of you on the phone, you'll just hear some silence and then you'll be on the line with the other people. So, all right. All right, so Allison, for some reason, I'm not seeing where I can do the breakout rooms. Do you see it? You're muted. I can just do it automatically quickly if we're ready. Okay. Yep. And so you'll get a thing that says the host is inviting you to join breakout room, blah, blah, and just hit the join button. Sam, I think um, you must have gotten invited to one that didn't join it. Do you have something that says join breakout room? Okay, and Donnell? I'm gonna assign you to a room and then join. Elder Donnell, did you wind up in a breakout room? I think I um, assigned, he came in as we were doing breakout rooms, but I assigned, Elder, I assigned you to one, but I think you have to, um, you have to accept it or go to the breakout room. Uh, I'm, I'm driving. Oh. I'm driving. Okay. And I'm on my way. I'm on my way home, so I'm kind of okay. Well, let's not do that. So then. let's see who is. Let's see who is in the breakout room where he was. I was going to go to it. Oh, okay. Because I, uh, Lenore was in one on her own, and then, um, but I put her in with Andrea and the whoever was the Samsung person, because I didn't know if they were ever going to unmute. So I actually put three in that group. That was a good idea.
Okay, so I guess we'll um, entertain people on Facebook for now. <laughs> Do we have people on Facebook? We did. There are not now. And how much time did he want in there? Do you know what? I can just tell you. Here we can put up the, the agenda. Yeah, so till 7.10, so maybe like 7.09, we call people back. Okay. I like how he um, said everybody has a house story. It's true. Yeah. What's your house story? Mine? Yeah. I don't know if I want to tell it on Facebook. <laughs> I'll tell you, it was really, um, I, I have been pretty fortunate. Um, but the points in my life where housing has been really difficult has been through divorces, the uh -huh. divorce of my parents um, and my own um, that just like presented all kinds of different challenges. Um, you know, I feel like that's such a common story that that divorce leads to housing insecurity. Yeah. My parents got remarried to each other when I was little, but you know what? They lost their house in the process. Well, and did that have to do with the policies we have around housing? Um, I don't know that it had to do with directly to do with policies around housing, but it just wasn't affordable for them separate, you know, mm -hmm. either one of them separate. Mm -hmm. So they had to sell it or they were going to get foreclosed, you know? Yeah. I do feel like so much of our policies are wrapped around um, this perception of how families are supposed to be, you know, with the husband and the wife and the 2.4 kids and the white picket fence. And it's like, that's just not reality for most of the families in the United States, but our policies and the ability to get what we need for our families is still wrapped in that that notion that doesn't really exist. Yeah, definitely. What's your housing story? Well, so my parents, what, 15 years ago, moved out of the house that I grew up in. So, you know, long after I did. Um, and, you know, when I moved to Cincinnati, I lived in Clifton because I had just graduated from college and that's where all the college students were, right? So that's what made sense to me at the time. And then I moved to Over the Rhine before it was trendy. Um, and because I was working in that neighborhood and I felt really split that I was living in Clifton and working in Over the Rhine. And so I wanted to live and work in the same neighborhood. Um, so I lived there for like 13 years um, until it was time for my son to start kindergarten. And then we moved to Westwood because that's where the school I wanted him to attend was. And I didn't want to put him on a bus. He says five minutes, we should bring people back. Okay. Um halfway across town. So what's ironic about all that is, you know, my rent was $245 a month. 
So I, I, I don't think you could run a shoebox in over the Rhine these days for $245 a month. So. Yeah, no. And it was a great apartment. So. So yeah, and then I bought this house and I, you know, I know we've done a lot to promote home ownership, but I always question like, and I know it's an investment and all that stuff, but man, it is also a drain to own a house. It is, yeah. And sometimes I wish I could just call the landlord and say, you need to get the plumber out here. <laughs> yeah. You know? Send somebody to fix my roof. Yeah. And I feel like there's this, you know, ethos of your, shouldn't pay more than 30% of your income on um, your housing. But I think it's harder when you own a house to figure out what that is in terms of, because you got to save every month to, you know, for when the furnace goes out and when you need a new roof. And like, I don't. Yeah, like what's the actual yearly cost of that? Yeah. I don't know. I only do one year budget. <laughs> that would be spread over 10 years and maybe you could figure it out. I know. It's like, it's kind of mind boggling. I mean, I'm the person who can't even shop for the grocery for two weeks because I, I can only plan for one week. <laughs> you know, Like I can only wrap my mind around a one week menu. I can't do a two week menu. So. Yeah. I gave him a five minute thing message. Do we have more Facebook people? No, not right now. Okay. It was funny when Elder Donnell joined and then we had Irene in the dark. We had Noel in the dark. It's like we have all these people in the dark. Is this a <laughs> metaphor? Now, when you go and close the rooms, it gives one minute, right? It does give one minute, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do that now. Okay. Yeah, it's funny. Like, I can't, I don't have breakout rooms now. You don't? Mm -mm. Oh, wait, mm -hmm. I bet I know why. It's because I'm sharing my screen. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then people will apparate again. And they'll be back. There, there they are. We're back. <laughs> Yay. That's my favorite thing ever, Andrea. It's like, you know, it's magic to me. I just love it. <laughs> oh, I 
wish it gave us more time. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to. We'll have to come back and do another session one on one too. But um, yeah, we, that we had a great conversation. Uh, interested in in some feedback and and how this felt for folks and uh, any things about the conversations you had you want to share. Yeah, I'm just gonna stop sharing this agenda so people can see each other. Well, I, I'll just say right now that, um, you know, Ms. Deborah Sims um, really shared a, a powerful history of race and housing through her own experience that like fits so well with, with a lot of um, the trainings and things we've developed. So it was very validating to me because I work with a lot of people in a lot of cities, but never worked with anybody in Cincinnati. So I'm like, huh, does this stuff make sense for Cincinnati? And, and I definitely got confirmation through her story that, that it does. So that was really great for me. Um, but yeah, uh, other folks want to talk a little bit about their conversations or any reflections they had doing this exercise. Well, I, I was telling the person that I was with, I'm Irene. I was telling the person that I was with, uh, as I grew up and as I became uh, a wife and mother and stuff, I didn't really have the stuff that she was telling me about her life. I mean, our, her housing situation. You know, she had been through a whole lot of things that I, I could never even think about going through. But then we ended up and she was telling me that uh, as of now, it's getting a little bit better. But you know, I guess you, I guess you just have to be in that kind of a situation and and struggle with that and everything. Whereas I, I really haven't. I mean, but I do understand. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's why it's so important to have these conversations and to ask these kind of questions. And while you may not, you know, in 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 your in your housing meetings, definitely this exercise is very simple, very great conversation starter, and I can send you a full write up to do longer versions of it. Um, but this has to kind of get embedded in how you do your one-on-ones because for the folks who haven't been through it, you, you have to be able to start to learn to listen for certain cues as to how to build relationships with people who are impacted by it. Uh, because while I'm going to get into some of the wonkier stuff and the more details of systemic things and policy, if, if you're not able to base build and connect with people about what they've been through, then, then, then you'll have a great analysis, but you won't have the power you need. Mm -hmm. um, so that is exactly what, what we want to happen in these types of exercises. Um, but yeah, I want to leave some space if other folks had good conversations or wanted to share anything out. Lenore and I talked and um, we talked, she gave me her life story about her housing and I gave her mine about going from apartments to houses to, to different cities. And, and I was just telling her how I really enjoy living in different cities and living in different diverse neighborhoods, you know, living with different kinds of people, African-Americans, Caucasians, Mexicans, Italians, you know, getting to know other people and their lifestyles by living in the neighborhood with them. And it's not that the apartments were so, I, I, I was lucky I was in the 70s, so we got to, I went from coast to coast, from New York to California. So you know that was a different living experience in itself right there. So, you know, I really enjoyed that. And the housing in New York was kind of different because, you know, everything in New York is kind of crunched together. But I lived in upstate New York. I lived in Schenectady in a house with relatives. And they lived in a very diverse neighborhood. So, you know, I was just saying how much I like diversity in the neighborhoods. Well, that's great, great feedback. I appreciate it. That was something that I see as a lack in my growing up. I mean, diversity was simply not there. Mm. You thought your neighborhood was diverse if there was a Catholic down the street. Wow. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> no, and that's and that's a powerful reflection too to get to see, um, you know, some of the bent not even just from a good or bad perspective, but just the difference of what it means when you've had a more stable housing story. Uh, you know, haven't seen as many of these things happening and, and, and that can also be agitational because, um, and also I want to make sure that we talk about privilege in a positive sense in that, 
you know, it's not a bad thing that, that some people have had it better than others. And I think all of our work is really should be centered around not shaming anyone for having it better than anyone else, but, but right. making a world where everyone has that opportunity and understanding the difference in why one person lived one way and one person didn't. Um, because, you know, in my world, I want, I want everybody to be able to, to grow up and live in and raise their children in the community that they want to, not the community they've been enforced to. So that's it's right. also really yeah. powerful for, for people to see the differences in each other and to really hear those stories. I mean, I, <laughs> I work long days and, and long nights, and a lot of it is because of the one-on-ones that I do. It's not because of the policy. It's because of that person I talked to, and I was like, wow, I can't believe you went through that. We, we, we have to change this. So uh, again, we're going to get into deep in the weeds, but everything about organizing has to do with the ability to base build and to connect with people around their self-interest in an issue. Um, so this exercise is a really quick and easy way to do that. Um, hope the other folks um, who, who had conversations got something out of it um, and, and hope that you all continue to try to encourage each other to, to share stories in this way and to practice these things so that the one-on-ones aren't so intimidating. Um, you know, when you have, to, when you, when it's just you and another person because you've done it in, in the group setting a lot. Um, so we're going to move on and I'm going to do uh, share my screen here. Uh, let's see. And are you all seeing uh, how subsidized gentrification works? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All and right. So, so um, for everybody, just for a point of reference, John, if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and mute people <coughs> and you'll be able to unmute yourself if you need to, but just in the interest of um, keeping background noise to a minimum. Yeah, I appreciate that. If you're able, uh, you can type stack into the chat or just type question and I will uh, find a time to pause and address the questions, but I would like to just be able to go through this and then I will pause and, and give people opportunities to, to share their thoughts uh, as we go through it. And I'm really interested into, into how this, this goes. So here we go. So uh, how subsidized gentrification works. First off, um, the word gentrification can, can seem wonky and intimidating at times, but it's really a simple word. Um, what a gentry is, is the class of people who own and rent to other people things. Um, so gentrification just means that you are changing the way that, that communities look to make, to prepare them uh, for a new higher class of people to move into them and for them to be rented out to a higher class of people. Uh, and it's really important that we understand this because, you know, our previous housing fights were against segregation, were to build public housing, were to make sure everyone is housed. And now that housing has been so um, commodified or made able to be made money off of, you know, we have a new fight in understanding how this process plays out. Um, so the first step in the process of gentrification uh, really starts with divestment. Uh, and I think a lot of people think of divestment as, as just kind of a general neglect. Uh, but the reality is that that divestment of neighborhoods is, is actually a very strategic and intentional part of urban planning. Um, and so most of our neighborhoods uh, were planned uh, through the Federal Home Loan Administration or the FHA uh, and its redlining practices in the, in the, in the 20s and 30s. Um, neighborhoods were planned uh, to have few opportunities, low service, and, and low property value. Um, as, as the divestment leads a community um, to be so undervalued <clears throat> that the real estate market starts to take interest, um, that market either takes interest initially or a group of elected officials or politicians um, use the narratives that have been built during the divestment period to convince people uh, that they need to subsidize investment in that neighborhood. And that usually happens through market rate and luxury development uh, that gets subsidized through historic preservation, especially in Rust Belt areas and older cities, uh, through tax breaks, which means corporations not paying taxes that they should owe or tax incentives, uh, which is ways in which um, extra uh, tax abatements and other things are offered to developers to develop in certain areas. Uh, the most egregious example of this recently was, was Trump passed 
uh, in the 2017 uh, budget, uh, what we call opportunity zones, uh, which are areas, uh, and I'm sure there's a few in Cincinnati, where major corporations pay no uh, corporate income or capital gains taxes if they build in certain neighborhoods. Um, what that then leads to is more luxury and subsidized development, and these tax breaks lead to improved services. And often people in our community conflate or, or confuse the fact that services are improving with the fact that conditions for everyone are improving. And so around the country, I know in Buffalo, uh, we had a whole bunch of bike groups. And again, there's nothing wrong uh, with bike groups and, and advocating for more bike lanes. Um, but when there are folks in communities who for 50, 60, sometimes even 70 years have been demanding some of these services, and all of a sudden, now that new groups of people are interested in a community, you start popping up with parks, gardens, bike lanes, trendy businesses, things like that, um, it, it becomes a, a, a different conversation because you know that the motivation isn't necessarily the improvement of that existing, of that community that's been there for so long and been there through, through all of the divestment, uh, but that it's actually about the people who are gonna be coming there um, and, the, and the next community to, to, to be attracted to that, that region. Um, next stage in the process is the turning around. Um, so when, when the market rate developments start to happen, anytime you build a $50 million building, a $100 million building, a $20 million building, part of the way that our housing market is structured is that it raises the value of all buildings around it, whether or not those buildings have actually been improved when it comes to conditions um, or anything like that. Um, so building bigger buildings, improving these services attracts more demand. And once those property values start to turn around, doesn't mean that the neighborhood is turned around, but just the values, um, then you'll start to see speculators, um, low level gentrifiers, house flippers, um, you know, people in the real estate market start seeing, oh, I can actually make some money in this neighborhood now that has been so undervalued for so long. And once that speculation starts to happen, you'll see rents start to go up. Uh, and I believe just cause eviction is one of the most important policies to fight because when you're trying to gentrify a community, when you're trying to redefine a community, the number one thing speculators do is they purchase a property and evict the tenants. Uh, because in many cases, that property is more valuable, a standalone, it needs to be remodeled or have work done to it, um, or you, you want a new class of tenants, so you kick the uh, existing tenants out, so you have time to remodel the place and attract those tenants that can pay the two and $3,000 rents. And so these two things have a deep, deep impact on our communities, uh, because you'll start to see renters uh, displaced very quickly and for other neighborhoods, usually first ring suburbs or the next neighborhood in the line of the series of neighborhoods that are getting ready to be gentrified, uh, but wherever is cheaper. Um, and then you start to see landlords charging these higher rents, which bring different people into the community, which then attract different businesses, which then bring more different people into that community and start this cycle um, where now rents just start skyrocketing and people are, are displaced and often, often become homeless. And, and this is also where you see crime, drug addiction and other things happen more and more uh, because people can't afford um, their, their housing. And um, so it's, 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 and then in this turning around phase, again, it, it may look and to politicians may tell a story about how the neighborhood's turning around, everything's getting better, everything's improving. The reality is newer, wealthier people are moving in, but the conditions for the people who've lived there are, are actually getting worse. Um, and so recently in Buffalo, we did a tax reassessment. Um, I know that uh, we had one member, Lucy Velez, uh, who you may have seen if you've come to some of the larger people's action events that happened before COVID. Um, and her house, she bought her house for $25,000. It was reassessed at $287,000, which meant that she went from going paying taxes on $25,000 to paying taxes on $287,000. Um, and so, you know, basically 10 times. 
and she paid her taxes through her mortgage. So most poor people, most people who are, you know, lower on the credit spectrum or need help with down payment and closing costs um, are, are given loans that actually attach the taxes you pay to the city to the mortgage, which means when your taxes go up, guess what else goes up? Your mortgage goes up and, 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 and mortgage companies force these refinances um, because they say, man, this $25,000 home is now worth 287. You better believe we're going to try to get you to remortgage the house for that that amount. And so that is another thing that pushes lots of homeowners out. And uh, most communities, especially in the Rust Belt, especially uh, in this, this northeast and mid north northeast Midwest region, um, often have tax foreclosure auctions, right? And then those foreclosure auctions, uh, people who couldn't pay their city's taxes homes are sold relatively cheap um, so that folks, so that new investors can come and buy them up wholesale uh, and start to flip them. Um, so when it gets gentrified, the new homeowners can pay the higher taxes, old homeowners, homeowners can't. A lot of people start selling or getting their homes taken. Uh, more residents are displaced. And this is where you also see policing totally change um, because these new folks have a different culture, different norms, and there's this idea of cleaning up the streets, that you have to clean up these neighborhoods to make them more palatable for this new class of people. And often that leads to many of our young black and brown folks um, being harassed uh, because, because of the racism of, of, of our policing system and the way that it's framed that you know a bunch of kids with no jobs hanging out on the corner are causing trouble. And the sad part about that policing bit is it often doesn't actually affect the drug activity and many of the things that are actually happening in the community, but is heavily focused on, on undermining um, black and brown and, and other young people um, who, who may be susceptible to crime, uh, but often doesn't actually get to the root cause of that crime. So I just went through a lot of information and want to take a pause here to see if there are folks, is this resonating? Is this feeling like things that are happening in, in Cincinnati and in your communities? And uh, yeah, I just want to give a little pause to let people react to, to all the things I just laid out. And you'll have to unmute yourself. So yeah, hi, uh, this is Noelle here. I, um, you know, I definitely see all of the things that you've talked about and it's definitely did exactly what you said, you know, one neighborhood sort of to the next, to the next. Um, and it's kind of a cycle actually that happens in Cincinnati at least. I'm Cincinnati born and raised. So, you know, it might be 30, 40 years ago, it was this neighborhood and then it went downhill and now it's coming back or whatnot. But, um, you know, with the uh, taxes piece, I thought that that was super relevant because, um, you know, I, I've uh, heard a lot about different areas where there are um, very old homes and families have owned the homes for a super, super long time. And then there's no mortgage even attached to it anymore. And then the kids move in, grandkids, great grandkids, whatnot. And, you know, they all of a sudden go from a very low tax to a very, very high tax, you know, as far as their only payment, um, but it's just something that they're not even aware of. And their house might not even be in the quality where it would qualify for that amount of money for it to be appraised at. And that actually happened with my house. And I had to go to the um, auditors to have like a reassessment done. I can't remember the exact words for it, but, um, I basically said, hey, this is my documented evidence that my house is not worth what you guys say it's worth because of X, Y, Z, you know, so pictures and whatever, and um, had the, the uh, appraised price reduced, which, you know, some people would think, well, that's bad, you know, you've less equity, but it really helped a lot with the taxable piece, um, but just navigating that stuff, you know, I mean, there's just no way that some of the people that I'm talking about that inherited a house from someone would even know how to go about doing any of those things. And so those are some of the gaps that I feel I find, um, you know, really between the people that are, are going to be able to be homeowners versus not, or be able to navigate the system successfully versus not, you know, um, so the, the, honestly, the people that get screwed over the most are the ones that might not 
have the access or ability or knowledge to, to really get what's fair and equal. And, and the reality is there is no fairness because there's no reward system for staying in your neighborhood. If your neighborhood improves and your house price skyrockets, there are two ways to get the value back out of your house, to move and sell it or to remortgage it to a bank. And so in both of those outcomes, you are giving up your sovereignty over your home well, in Cincinnati, I'm just, I have to cut in. I'm so sorry, but man, the, the value is having a freaking house to live in. Trying right. to find somewhere else to move is completely impossible. I mean, just how difficult it is to go look for places, do the stupid application, pay the darn fee, have all the documents you need. I mean, if you're in a house, especially when we're only owing taxes, you need to stay your ass home. You're safe and secure. I mean, it's really, it's really a dangerous thing to to try to cash out, or, or the value is literally in having somewhere to live. Like that. Yeah, so let's fun. let's let's hear somebody else's story too. I see Dorothy has her hand up. Uh, yes, um, I am extremely concerned about this gentrification thing. Uh, because the Lick Run project is finally nearing completion and it is looking really good. Um, they tore a lot of properties down. Um, there are still a lot of vacant properties, but they are starting to be purchased and flipped. And I'm just really concerned about what's going to happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I think that uh, if you could just briefly tell me what that project is. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the, there's uh, the consent decree from the EPA that was passed, um, oh gosh, probably around 2000, um, mandated that uh, localities that had combined sewer overflows that exceeded their specifications had to redo uh, their system so that uh, it was within specifications. Mm -hmm. The Lick Run project has separated storm runoff from sanitary drainage for uh, the neighborhood of South Fairmount and some of the surrounding hillsides to uh, fulfill that decree. And it, what, what we're ending up with is a mile long park in the middle of the neighborhood with a uh, daylighted stream that will be filled by the rainwater. And um, like I said, there were a lot of properties torn down. It's been an ugly mess for probably six years at least at this point, but uh, it's getting close to um, doing the final uh, repaving and restriping. And that's the, the end of the project. As, and to, uh, except for the maintenance of it, it's it's gonna it's gorgeous. <laughs> and Dorothy, yeah. would you say that South Fairmount was a neighborhood before this project started going on? Was a neighborhood that experienced a lot of divestment? Um, yes, it, and it was also extremely diverse. Um, when I moved in here in uh, 92, 93, there were a, a, a nice mix of white, black, Mexican, Asian. It was just a really diverse neighborhood. Um, it was very, I won't say vibrant, it didn't have a lot of business, but it was a very busy neighborhood and it was very neighborly. Um, with all the destruction, uh, a lot of that has passed, sadly, but I think we can get it back 
but how we go about getting it back will determine the um, the ability of people like me to stay here. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just want to say that one of the things that makes this so hard is that um, really all of the frameworks of economic development, and if you ever hear elected say that, really they're talking about gentrification. And to me, economic development is about actually developing the human beings in a neighborhood and their capacity to own businesses, exchange goods and services, and develop an actual economy. This process actually just says, we're gonna replace this economy with one that, we, that is already in flux and has already received government capital. And, and the sad thing is they would never give um, the equivalent of the resources that they're giving out in tax breaks to these communities if there wasn't a plan moving forward. And so I'm not sure what your urban planning infrastructure looks like, but there, beyond whatever is going on in that neighborhood right now, there is a plan to leverage that consent decree. And we use that in Buffalo to create our, our Push Blue program. Mm -hmm. um, there's a plan to use that consent decree to attract more investors and to attract um, you know, more people to that neighborhood. And it's hard because mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing to do a combined sewer flow out project. It's not a bad thing to improve parks and services. The question is the timing. The question is, would they have improved those parks and services 10 years ago in that same neighborhood, right? And that that leads you to like the capital that's on the other side of these plans. And so again, they're Trojan horses. They offer us things that we've been asking for for a long time under the guise mm -hmm. of saying, we're finally listening to you. And then it's a bait and switch. Um, and it's really important that you start to understand what are the entities that give out historic preservation uh, grants and tax breaks who, who has the right, like who has the power over tax breaks and incentives? And usually they're public-private partnerships. They're usually some kind of board that has a couple county electeds, a couple city electeds, and then a large number of business people that totally mm -hmm. outweigh all of all of our collective self-interest. And those are really areas it, it's of It's called power 3CDC movement. here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. And the port. Yep. Uh, and then there's usually one around economic development, one around housing, one around transportation, and then there's ways that they all come together and decide these big ideas. So uh, I think those are really great points of leverage because often our city councils are clueless as well. They're not digging deep into the weeds of these things. They're simply listening to the real estate community, which, again, that's their tax base. And they're, they're sold this idea that if they offer free taxes up front, they'll get more taxes later, which is the oldest trick in the book. And so, so much of this is really about figuring out what the root cause is. Where is the source? Where is the message and the money coming from? And I always focus on the message and the money because oftentimes decision makers are following the money and the message of, of people with money. They're not actually intentionally making decisions. They're just letting this process go because this is the theory of how a modern city develops, right? And it really is based mm -hmm. out of New York City, Chicago, Atlanta, all these cities where you see massive homelessness, massive tensions with police. They did this for generations and that's what got us here. Um, so I could go on forever about these things, but <clears throat> in our next section, we wanna talk about how the cultural narrative changes over these times. Uh, so in Buffalo, the renaissance, the resurgence, the revitalization of Buffalo is what you'll hear in the news, what you'll hear coming out of elected officials' mouths, what you'll hear out of even nice, again, nice white folks, nice people who are saying, hey, the neighborhood's getting better. I'm going to start a bike club. I'm going to fix up this park. Again, not bad things individually, but this, this re-narrative starts to build and it really is reinforcing this idea that this is an inevitable process that is the result of just how the market naturally works. When, if you go back to here, you see how much state investment is required, how much subsidy is required to, to get this process going. And our vision is really based on, well, forget the luxury and market rate people. What if you subsidize public housing? What if you subsidize affordable housing? What if you subsidize mortgages for people uh, from previously redlined populations? And how do we create a vision that says all this money that you've been throwing around in the news, none of it's coming to us. None of it's, and usually jobs are a big narrative that are built into this too, right? Um, that, that 
Um, people need jobs. And in order to get jobs, we have to move these new businesses in. And if we give away all these tax breaks, these companies are going to come in and they're going to employ our people. The reality is none of these companies are going to be hiring 18 year old high school dropouts. None of these companies are going to be hiring the kids that are on your corner trying to figure out what to do with their lives because they can't get access to jobs because they didn't have a quality education. The jobs that they do bring are going to be high level sales jobs, medical jobs, uh, high level education, university jobs. Um, they're going to be even in the service industry, right? They're going to be Starbucks and restaurants. There's not going to be a McDonald's where, where a young kid can go get a part time job. The, the, the places <laughs> that the gentry go are not the kind of places that our people can work. Uh, and so that's another illusion that we have to start to push back against. And then what you also get is, as I said, militarized anti-poor policing. So it's get the homeless out. And, and, and the sad thing is the process is what created this homelessness. But now it's, oh, we got to get the homeless out. Um, and so the policy is really controlled by the real estate and business interests to protect their profits and to change the image of the neighborhood mm -hmm. by getting undesirable people of color out of the region. And so Again, as an organization, you can come at this from a housing perspective. You can also reach out to the youth that are um, almost certainly being harassed by police and start to bring them into the conversation about the fact that they're not being, they're not being made any safer by being harassed by police and they're not getting any better access to housing by giving all of our money to these, these big developers. And those are two big narratives that they like to use. And that's the beauty of, of our organizing and our stories is that our stories actually challenge the, the story that they wanna tell. Um, and so I just wanna, these are quotes from folks in Buffalo. I would love to work with you all to research some of the biggest developers in Cincinnati and the ways that they're connected to national networks. Um, so a lot of people look at our communities as they are. They look at our communities as they've seen them during the phase of divestment. Developers see our communities like all colonizers as what they could be. Um, and so land use is a old and deep ideology that, that, that started really with, with colonization and people who saw the land we live on today as America as opposed to uh, belonging to the indigenous communities that came here before. And so I really love this quote because it really captures how these folks think and therefore how we need to think sometimes. We don't wanna download all of their processes, but we need to understand how the development community thinks about us so we can start to develop strategies that push back against what they wanna do. Uh, so the quote is, the guys that bought the land before are good for them. They will make money, but that doesn't mean because I paid more, I'm not gonna make money. The market has moved, it has gone up, the land is worth more and rents are higher. So when you come from a divested community, you don't see your community as, as a place for investment, as something that's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. You see it as where you've lived. And so when someone comes in with this attitude, um, often we get duped into thinking that they wanna help us develop our community when the reality is they wanna control the land, own the land and flip it. And when they flip the land, they use other lower level people to flip the land that they can't flip. And so Nick Sinatra is financed uh, by this guy named Tom Barrick, and he owns a group called Colony Capital. And he's a billionaire who manages a $30 billion fund. And basically what that fund does is a lot of rich people give him a lot of money and he finds someone like Nick Sinatra in Buffalo or someone like a, a developer in Cincinnati. And he says, hey, I got $34 billion. Figure out how you can build buildings and I will invest in your building. So if you build a $100 million building, I already have tons of investors ready to go and they're gonna fill in the value of that building. And as soon as you have those investors, you sell the building to those investors and you build another building. And so people like Nick Sinatra are looking at how do I pay the least taxes possible? And how do I get into the communities that are most underdeveloped so I can build as many buildings as possible? And in New York City right now, there are I think about 30,000 units of what we call warehouse units, which means they're entire buildings that are empty. They're not even trying to rent them out. They just built the building because a building is the best tool of investment right now in American society. So if I build a $100 million building next year, it's going to be worth 110 million, no matter what I do to it. If I rent it out, 
if I, I could just let it sit and it will automatically appreciate in value. And it's actually less risky for a lot of investors to build a hundred million dollar building and let it sit empty than even deal with having tenants. And so that is how far this process has gone in New York City. And the reality is in cities like Cincinnati and Buffalo, it's just starting, but this is the mindset that people have about land and how to control it and how to pull as many resources out of it. <clears throat> and so in our national work, we wanna identify the people in every city across the country that Donald Trump and Tom Barrick are supporting to gentrify communities and we want to identify those people and what they're doing, and we want to get access to the government resources that they're getting access to. Why, why should these type of investors be getting billions of dollars of tax breaks and free land? Um, that, that consent decree could have just as easily been done through the community uh, as opposed to, uh, to the process that it went through. Um, so I just want to name, um, you know, again, you know, people see Donald Trump as, as a fool and an idiot in the White House, but the reality is he really did create a framework to redistribute wealth um, and to be able to, from New York City, gentrify every city in the world without having to go anywhere. Um, and so we, we, even though he's no longer president, he's still a major target for us because he is so influential in how... Um, how we do this this process of figuring out how to deal with the real estate processes that are happening to our communities. And I just want to finish this section with this, this quote. Um, the oppressed, having internalized the image of the oppressor, have adopted his guidelines and are fearful of freedom. And so I want to make sure that, you know, so often in housing conversations, we tend to think of what is possible through the lens of what has already happened and what we've been told is possible. Uh, someone early on said, well, we, we want our communities to look great, but we don't want them looking like projects. Well, when the projects were first built, they were beautiful, right? Before the federal government decided to divest from them, uh, they were absolutely beautiful and anchored communities across the country that many of you all, I'm seeing by your head nods, can remember. And so we have to make sure that our organizations are not limiting their vision um, to the narrative that is built during divestment, right? Because that is what then allows these, these people to come in and sell us on the idea that their investments can improve our communities. At, at the most simplest form, an investment is a promise to pay later. If I invest in you, I'm not investing in you uh, and again, this is this is how business works. We often talk about investing in each other as leaders in a very beautiful way. But the majority of people, when I invest in something, I'm waiting to get more out, right? That's the number one thing. So when someone says, I want to invest in your community, when people start to use that language of investment, remember, at some point, they're going to want more out than they put in. And that's exactly how gentrification works. We, we, we want our communities to look good. People come into them and say, we want to make them look better. And we're not thinking about the fact that they might make them better today, but in five years, in 10 years, in whatever their timeline is, at some point, they are going to want not just a return on investment, but real estate folks want a significant return on investment. And they want control of the property and control of all of the processes that happen in those communities. And that's something, unfortunately, our elected officials often also want, because in their minds, that is what's going to give them the property taxes and the resources that they need uh, to run their political patronage systems. And, you know, we, we want to be very clear, while there are all kinds of new technologies, new people getting involved in politics, in, in most regions of the country, old poly politics still rule. Um, and, and our political systems are really engineered um, to limit um, the progress that we can make uh, by funneling everything through a jobs program for a few people uh, and using all of our government resources to create jobs for our political parties um, so that they have people that can keep them in office. And so I, I leave this quote here because we have to start to get really creative about how we create a new image for our community um, and how as we create that image, we don't get caught in the trap of looking to the private market, of looking to these investors uh, to save us, but actually of, of figuring out how through land trusts, uh, through affordable housing cooperatives, through different mechanisms, 
people can control and hold money and hold those resources um, because most of us don't have LLCs. Most of us don't have 401ks, Roth IRAs, and attorneys and other folks that can help us figure out how to hide our money and keep it away um, from, from being taxed and from paying interest and all these things that these other folks do. Uh, so again, they're coming in fully shielded um, and handing us some smallpox blankets um, that slowly poison us in ways that we're not clear on. So uh, I think it's just so important that, that we make sure um, that we are clear on how we want our communities to look. And um, again, I'm gonna pause again to, 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 to see, is this resonating? Are there neighborhoods and areas in your communities or where you live that you see this happening? Um, and who are some of the people you think are actually in charge of these kinds of processes? Oh, definitely it's happening in Bond Hill Roseline because that's what we're fighting against now. We, I'm one of the people that on my street, they wanted to build a uh, low income housing down the street from us. And we went to the port and fought them and they, they, we won. The property is still empty, but they won. But then there's property down that the port is going to build on right across from Woodward High School and they sent us the plans and uh, they claim they want us to be part of the planning process. Um, they were rejected once, but then they got together and came back with another plan and uh, for daybreak because daybreak fought them on what they wanted. And uh, they came back with a better plan, quote unquote for what they wanted, but they have to realize the high school is across the street. They built a brand new high school across the street. So when they built that high school, we knew something was coming. It used to be Swift and Commons, and then it was the old Woodward. And then a church bought it, really couldn't handle it, and they sold it to the port. Now the port is, is building and they've sent us a whole, it's gonna be beautiful when, when they finish, but as yeah. I put in the chat, they call me all the time for my house all the time for our houses. They, on my street, they flipped at least four houses already. Um, and none of the people who sold them their houses, you know, because of the taxes. Um, they didn't live in their parents' home and so they couldn't keep up their homes and their parents' homes, so they sold them. And uh, the people flipped them for like three times what they will work. So, um, yeah, I understand, but you know, what can I mean, what can you do if like you said if you don't have the political power or the money to stop these developers or get your own developing company? Could I jump in? Sure. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um so uh the the first thought is uh board of revision is where I went to have my property value assessed. So if anyone is being taxed at a too high level property value board of revision, I think that like uh, maybe it's, it's January, February is the deadline to get your paperwork in. Um, and then uh, the second thought is uh, I was on some things in Avondale, which of course we know is being gentrified a lot. And um, we went through LIST, L-I-S-T. C or CS, L-I-S-C. I think it's L-I-S. Support Corporation. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, also the Xavier Community yeah. Building Institute to do a quality of life plan. And the quality of life plan is adopted by the city council. And it um, incorporates sort of like they're saying, we want to hear what all of you guys have to say. But really they get the what everybody has to say in writing and that's the first step to getting a community benefits agreement so if they're going to say they're going to hire people well they best hire people or else we're going to come and tell them look right here in the paper you said you were going to hire people and you didn't and we can outline we want people that don't have a high school diploma or else we want a work program that's going to get them a certificate that qualifies them to work for your company. And then you're going to hire X amount of people from this neighborhood or this many affordable housing things are going to stay in this neighborhood or the zoning. Hello, the zoning, man, that the zoning does a lot for the neighborhood. And that's a sneaky way that they sneak stuff in there. They were trying to take um, uh, this, this, this high density and change it down to uh, like a uh, single family. And I'm like, 
hold on, what are you going to do with those 350 people that you're going to like this place, right? And so another thing in the community benefits agreement is that, you know, anyone that you displace has to have quality subsidized housing that are is equal or equivalent or whatever, you know, um, what they currently have inside of the neighborhood. Uh, and so it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty much a legally binding document and then you, you let the people be a part of it. But this is what happened to us, all right, guys? So um, a lot of input was given over a 10 month period of time. In the very beginning, it was like a lot of brainstorming and this, that, the other. So when the nitty gritty and the bare bones stuff started to happen, it was 10 months in and we were meeting twice a week and this set, so the, the, the email list dwindled down, whatever, whatever. So basically the people who represent the people that are actually being affected, like the homeowners that we're talking about protecting weren't at the meetings. Guys, I was at these meetings and they were talking about, well, we should do this at the other because then the people that won't conform are just going to be squeezed out of the neighborhood. And I'm like, these are my friends. Guys, I was the only person standing up for these people that they were talking about. They're squeezing them out of their neighborhood, yeah, damn it. I, I just so, wanna... Noel, it sounds like you've been through a lot in your community. And I know the <laughs> other folks on this call have also had some rich experiences in their communities. Is there... Yeah. Did, did anybody else want to talk about that? Uh, well, College Hill. Uh, someone called me a couple of weeks ago, asked me, was I selling my house? Yeah. And um, I've noticed, you know, we've got a lot of uh, construction going on on the corner up here of uh, Hampton Avenue in North Bend. But uh, I feel that some of my neighbors feel the same way. Uh, are we going to be pushed out? I was, one of the neighbors was afraid that uh, our neighborhood was, uh, we were going to get pushed out. Uh, there was a house built right behind us. We don't even know where the road leads to this house, but it was built. And yeah, we're starting to wonder, uh, is it time for us to go? One of the things that we started to do um, on the Bond Hill Community Council is we have developed a relationship with Bethany House. And they're definitely building at St. Aloysius and they have made us a part of their plan. So we are, have gotten in with Bethany House. And one of the things that we suggested was some of these properties that they're drug dealers and prostitution around in Bond Hill, we've encouraged them. We found addresses, we've been working together. Uh, we've even found some of the uh, property, the rental property owners, and we're trying to get Bethany House to get money to buy them so that when the people that matriculate through Bethany House, if they own some of these properties, that'll give people affordable housing and that'll give them jobs too, because the people are being, like you said, misplaced with children, maybe single mothers, or they've gone through the same thing of being put out of their family homes because of the taxes they couldn't afford. So we're encouraging some of these places like Bethany House to buy some of these property and to use their program to get people affordable housing and teach them uh, work skills. So that, that's, that's really great. And I think um, what I want to say to what Noel was saying and a lot of people are saying before is you all need to start to build your own agenda and you need to work with the folks in your neighborhoods to build your own agenda. As long as you are engaged in their planning process, they are dictating how your input is seen, they're dictating the story. I'm sure in every one of these planning processes, the main role that you all play is so that when they do their press conference, they can say, we talked to this many community members before we came up with this terrible plan to gentrify their community. And, as, and so there's a way in which you, you Noella, and I hear you, you, you were supposed to be the only one there advocating for your community because those meetings were not set up for your community. And there's two ways to go about that. One, is to start your own processes in each neighborhood or as many of the, you have the capacity to organize well um, around developing awareness that, that something can be done about this. And I think the like, I shall not be moved, we won't move narrative, just it really resonates, um, especially with the folks who've been there for a long time. Like why should they have to move? Um, the second thing is 
you know, you have to create tension in those spaces and you have to be organized. So you as an individual going as one person is great to report back, but we have to create processes and, and kind of base building campaigns that will set a stage to say that when those meetings happen, they intend for them to only be a certain number of people. And then you come in with 50 of your community members and you say, this is our meeting. This is our meeting, this is our neighborhood and we are dictating the agenda. And the beauty of, of I think the, the opportunity you have here is that their niceness is a tactic that is used to diffuse your power. And when you stop responding to their attempts to engage you in planning and these nice little things, and you start calling out the actual impact of what is gonna happen to your communities when they do what they wanna do, their public image starts to erode and they will start to be willing to do more and more and more. But again, if you get diffused by, well, of course, come on in the planning meeting. Yeah, we'll change everything for you. We'll read, you know, and they and they have, they, they're, they're, it's a profession. You know, there, there are people who go to school to do community development work, which is really just hustling communities uh, into believing just long enough for them to get their planning and their zoning. And so the beauty of you guys is you already know the leverage points. You already have um, a clear analysis of who's doing what, but we need to turn that into a power analysis. And we need to actually think about what do each one of you want for your communities who has the power to give it to you? And how do you tell a story to those targets and to the rest of the world, to their voting base that says, if you start working with these developers before you work with the community, you are selling your community out, not building it up. And that takes time because they've been doing this for a long time. And I'm sure there's a couple political machines in Cincinnati that have been playing golf and going out to dinner with developers for you know, 15, 20 years. But the reality is we have the truth on our side. And so in every community, there are people teeming in that community um, that have feel, that feel this oppression in the same way you do. And so I feel again, like you all actually know the strategy you need to operationalize. You know where the power is. The question becomes, what is, what is, your, what is your top two or three demands? And how do you start to engage the rest of the community so that you can show up not as individuals, but as KUFA, you know, 100 people deep saying, we're not having it. We're not having it. We're not going for these, these, this salesmanship. You all have been given X number of millions of dollars to do this project. That money actually belongs to us. And that money needs to go into things that benefit young people, that benefit single mothers, um, and that help us actually build an economy in our community, not just bring in outside people to, to kind of wash that away. Um, so I'm actually really excited to hear um, a lot of the work that you've already been doing. And I think that, that, that what we can do is start to provide some clarity about where to focus. Um, what I wanna ask the group now is, what, what are some of the ideal things that you'd want to be able to do? Um, I know that, you know, you had talked about community benefits agreements, but before we even get into the tactic, like what, what are the things that you all want? Then once you know what you want, you can figure out who has power over that and how to target them um, and how to really target them with tension, not with just meeting, not with just saying, hey, we want to sit down with you and talk to you because these folks are making billions of dollars, right? Even the affordable housing folks. Um, if you think about affordable housing, a affordable housing organization gets a developer fee that's 15% of the total cost of the project. Uh, so they're making, everybody is making money off of this process. They're telling you that they wanna hear your opinions, but the only reason they want your opinions is so that they can tell the government who's giving them the subsidies that they talk to you. And when you start telling the government entities that, well, they talked to us, but they didn't do what we wanted and we want to continue meeting with them, you'll see that they're going to start to change their tunes because you're going to have leverage over them. You have something they want, right? Every developer wants a good public image and a lot of public money. And so in every one of these processes, if you're able to challenge their public image and you're able to work with elected officials to stop or even slow down their public money, they're going to start jumping through hoops for you. They're going to start wanting to have meetings with you because they know that you're an actual threat to their bottom line. But uh, I just went on a little rant there. So I'm going to pause and uh, give folks an opportunity to, to answer the question, which is what, what, what do you all want to see in your neighborhoods? 
And is and what can we do to start to think about who else wants that and how to start building power around that? I have a lot to say. If you guys want to hear more from me, I'm sorry. I, I actually wanted to contribute. Okay. Um, I've I've been dipping my feet in and out of the water of trying to become a homeowner and I've been unsuccessful to date. Um, part of it is that when I go out and I look at homes that I believe are affordable for me um, based on you know the listing price, uh, they're not livable. And that's that's the primary problem. And before I even started looking, you know, just watching things happening in neighborhoods, I wanted most of all to just see the houses restored to livable condition, not torn down in favor of other things, but restored. And I, as a person who's never owned a home and has always wanted to have really stable housing, I think the idea of watching buildings collapse or watching developers buy them and flip them and make them absolutely unattainable has been really emotional for me, has been, has been really defeating for me. And I imagine it's really defeating for other people who have had similar struggles with employment or similar struggles with housing. And so if I had the, the power to ask exactly what I wanna see, it would be programs where that funding that would otherwise go to those major developers would go to little people who can maybe afford a $100,000 home, but not a 200 or 300 or $400,000 home to restore a house that is right now listed for 10,000, 5,000, 40,000 or $60,000 in this in a, in a, in a state that is completely unlivable because either it doesn't have plumbing, it's been ripped out or it doesn't have a, a proper roof or it doesn't have all these other things that make it function as a house that that's what i want to say no that's that's really really powerful and i i just want to say that there are i'm sure for every there's there's plenty more people out there like you um and and we need to we have to find them because i think that so much of what organizing is about is about politicizing private pain we all have these experiences and, and often we feel like it's just us or we're a failure or there's something wrong with us. And when we get in groups of people and recognize, no, actually this system is designed to produce these outcomes. Um, you know, those are the moments when we can really come together as communities and say, yeah, we, we all deserve to have a home. There's plenty of homes out here and there's plenty of money. And now it's your job, elected officials and developers to figure it out. And if you don't figure it out, uh, you know, that's where the, the voter engagement, direct action, like there's, there's all of these tactics that you can use um, and they're very contextual. So I don't know how Cincinnati works, but I feel like you all have a good sense of how to push your people. Um, but really it starts with having that vision um, that drives you to push them. Uh, because they're not going to create the program for you. They're not going to come up with this magical idea of how to solve the problem. Actually, this is the group of people that has to come up with that idea that's rooted in your experience, and, and you have to really push it onto them and to the people who influence them, um, because they're all, they all have donors. They're, every elected is an organizer. Every developer is an organizer that has a base of customers, a base of donors, and a base of people that they actually draw your, their power from. So um, there's so many beautiful ways that, that, that communities can come together to affect the power, but it's really important to be clear on what you want uh, because power can see nothing without not just a demand, but an explicit and clear demand. Uh, and these folks are so good at saying, oh yeah, that's what you want, sure. And then you know, down the line, they give you something that is not what you want. So um, I'll stop there and give some space for other folks to talk about things that they envision and things that they wanna see for the community. So I hear uh, a home rehabilitation and ownership program is, is what I hear uh, out of your story. Um, and again, there's, there's a wonky side of, of getting into the weeds of that, but we really wanna start with who are the people who want what you want and how do we continue to, 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 to build the base of power? But I'll stop there. Bond Hill was trying to grow their business district again. At one time, we had a real uh, 
thriving business district on Reading Road between Mercy and um, Seymour Avenue. But now everything is torn down on Reading Road. We have some businesses that we're trying to <laughs> get rid of. Um, Port has put some money into it with other organizations that have had money, but the Port's not doing Bond Hill right. I'm sorry, they're not doing a lot of neighborhoods right. And so um, uh, we just need to find uh, maybe developers that are willing to invest in the Bond Hill area that will give us some, uh, that will attract um, income you know, have jobs for people. Like you said, those young people that are standing out on the corner. Um, um, some type of work programs for those young people, you know? The Bond Hill, can I say something? Uh, yeah. Elder Donnell, uh, Bond Hill is a good neighborhood. I always have been, it's a growing it neighborhood. Is. We've seen it, it go up and we've seen it come down. But Bond yes. Hill right now is doing better than some of the other neighborhoods. It's some instruction going on in Bond Hill. They building up and they tearing down. Uh, it's Middleman, I don't, he made a lot of promises he didn't keep. It's a lot of uh, political people stay right there in Bond Hill. So to me, Bond Hill is looking up slowly but surely. However, we... other neighborhoods is nowhere near Bond Hill. You don't think some so? of the other neighborhoods in the city has not seen any type of funding or backing or anything. Now I was a resident of Bond Hill. I just recently moved from Bond Hill. I went to some of the council meetings. I canvassed in that neighborhood. I did a lot. I even went up to the school to several meetings. I don't know if you're aware when they was having the meetings up there at the at the at the uh, high school and. Uh, it's, I think uh, I think Bond Hill uh, is on its way to growing back. I think it's on its way. I think it's on its way. It's got a good head start compared to some of the other neighborhoods like downtown Avondale and 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 uh, uh, Westwood and places like that. But mostly, what I want to speak about is. I feel the young lady that just got off said that she's been trying to find her a home and she's been wanting to be a home owner just about all her life. Well, I have too. I come up in the area where it wasn't many black home owners that I was aware of. I was in the area where I was still waiting on my uh, 40, acres, my, my 40 acres and my mule. So I have been struggling myself trying to find me a home that's affordable for me and my family. I went through my, the home class, uh, graduated from the home class. I got good information and everything. I talked to some agents and I was living in one area where the landlord took and sold the house right up and under. He didn't tell us anything about it. Next thing we know, we get a notice in the mail, like, hey, you got to get out of here. You know, what do you mean? I got to, where the owner at? The owner is nowhere around. He, we're the new owners now. He sold everything to us. So that took me all the way back to the beginning from the ground. I lost a lot and I ain't recovered from that yet. But I always had a dream of owning my own house. I always been the type of person that said, hey, uh, when I get old enough, I want to be able to buy my mother and my father a beautiful home. And I see other people uh, living in nice home. Hey, why can't I live in a nice home? So that's always been my dream. And I have always stuck to that. And I'm 66 years old now. 66. And it still hadn't came to place. So... Uh, is it? Uh, I hear what the gentleman's saying about we got to band together. We got to ask the right questions. We got to stick together. We we got to uh, pull together and work together. And you know, one person or two person or three person can't get anything done. It's going to take a whole lot of people that, that that's willing to 
come out and let their voices be heard what exactly what need to be done in a particular neighborhood or for the first time home buyers or owners like myself. I've been renting, 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 and I'm sick and tired of renting. All the rent I've been paying, I, I should have had two or three houses by now, I feel. So I just want a divorce. I couldn't join one of your groups at the time because I was in the car driving home and I wanted to get home safe. And I wanted so bad to get in one of the groups so I can voice my opinion as far as home owners and first time buyers. I'm dedicated for into that and I'm still striving for that. Uh, I just got to get the right connect or meet the right people and uh, come together with people like me, share almost the same dream and who want their own house and who's sincere about it and serious about it. And we're not just uh, running off at the mouth or blowing smoke. This, this to me is very emotional. Uh, when I hear stories like that, it just breaks my heart because I'm a part of it and I can feel where they coming from. Kind of going through the same struggles or even harder or less. I don't know what the situation might be, but this is heartbreaking that we are in uh, areas of 21 and people is still struggling day by day uh, just to uh, pay the water bill, just to pay the gas and electric bill. People are still being <laughs> set outside. I rode past the other day, a whole family, they had set their furniture out on the sidewalk. In crisis like this, they still study turning off this and that. And, and we're American people. You know, we, we, we live here. I've been, I've been born and raised there all my life. I was born in General Hospital, which is universally now. And it, it, it's, it's heartbreaking to see us Americans right here at our <laughs> own town and city being set out on the sidewalk or being, or the lights is being cut off or the water, you know, enough is enough. Something got to be done, and it got to be done now, more than later. Thank you for listening to me. I really appreciate it, and I just want to name that. That passion is what drives all of us to to beat the odds that, that we're up against. So um, I want to see if there's maybe one or two more people that we haven't heard from to talk a little bit about uh, what they would like to see in the neighborhoods. I just want to give like three offers of advice for the people that want to be homeowners. Habitat for Humanity is a com very, very underutilized program. And so I know I heard, um, I heard you speak about the fact that programs are effective, you know, and, and so that one, you only need like uh, the 470 credit score. You just need to be able to um, meet the qualifications for a $500 a month, you know, mortgage payment, so also working in neighborhoods, they don't just get you through a program to help you learn how to be a homeowner. They actually like help you get connected to a house. So when WIN, working in neighborhoods and Habitat for Humanity, and also um, buying a home for like, uh, someone is talking about there's very cheap homes, you know, but like a $40,000 house that might need $20,000 worth of work you cannot really get a mortgage. Like it was very, very difficult to get a mortgage for that. It'd be much easier to get a personal loan. So if you have this credit income thing where you're close enough to be able to get money lended to you, much easier to buy a home through a personal loan. And then if you have that personal loan money, it might be much easier also to negotiate with places like the port or whatnot. But that's the way you would get a, a ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar house and put twenty thousand into it, um, more so than than getting a mortgage payment. Um, but then, of course, you know you have to do the taxes and insurance. Um, so whatever the revision thing might be important. And I just wanted to also get one thought on. Um, we have this thing going around that is uh, being talked about a lot as far as the affordable housing trust fund. I didn't know as far as your experience in New York. What do you know about that? And what are your thoughts? Um, my, my, my thoughts are one that like with affordable housing trusts, they're usually pennies. Uh, they're usually drops in the bucket. And so, you know, I, 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 I like six million. 
yeah, what what you know the the average affordable housing it costs about three hundred thousand dollars a unit. Um, you know, so when you have six million dollars, um, you know, and then again, it might take five or six years to accumulate that six million. They may borrow against it, but to me, again, it's a lot of a lot of developer math, and it's a lot of like how do we subsidize the market. And I think programs are most effective when they are designed, mm. run, and controlled by regular people. When a program is designed and run through grant structures, through nonprofits, not, I don't want to downplay the hard work that people are doing, um, but but I come from a, a power building perspective. Right. And that is to say that like we cannot solve our problems through the existing things that have been put out there. What's been put out there is what has been vetted and what is safe for the people who are profiting from it and what they are okay with. And so I think your knowledge of programs could be, is, is genius because I think you're the person that then knows how to design the programs that actually will work for people. Um, and and I, I hear a lot of talk about vacant property. Um, so there's a lot of strategy. Well, the most powerful strategy to build affordable housing is controlling the land. Uh, and that's, you know, we ran a campaign here in Buffalo to get 48 um, lots out of the city of Buffalo for a neighborhood called the Fruit Belt, uh, where they built a university and a medical campus on top of the oldest black neighborhood in Buffalo. And they basically cut the neighborhood in half, leveled it, just eminent domain, got everyone out. And again, this is 2008, 2009, 2010. And then started to have, after that, started to have community meetings about planning the future of the neighborhood with a bunch of white folks who wanted university jobs. And they called that a community process. And we challenged that. And we basically put a sign on every, there were 400 vacant properties in that neighborhood. We put a sign on every single lawn and say, this, this property belongs to the community. Uh, if you want the deed, knock on the, the, knock on the, the, the door of the next door neighbor, right? Don't go to city hall. And so um, creating this moral site control, this idea that like we morally control our communities and proving that what's going on is not benefiting people um, is, 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 is really powerful. And so what I wanna say is that um, you know, community benefits agreements, affordable housing trusts, all of these things, again, they're, they're not bad things, but they ultimately do not give you control over what happens to land. And the only thing that really does that is, 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 a, is a land trust. Um, I think the affordable housing trusts can work if you are in deep relationship with the affordable housing providers that have already agreed to your values. Um, and again, affordable housing providers, I, I push Buffalo was one. And I think that we were very conflicted about how we had to operationalize our organizing values while implementing them as an affordable housing provider. And so the truth is this is all about power and negotiations. The technical things come second. You all have the power to get what you want. You have the clarity to get what you want. And I think a lot of what it's going to be with this group is tapping into that passion, that fire, and that aggression to say, you've offered us these options, but these options are not working. And we've actually sat down. We've created a model for how these programs could work. We know you have the money, right? Because we see all these other things being done. And to start to demand what you all want and to set the tone of the negotiation. Uh, because every one of those things that, that you mentioned and is in the chat, all of those things can work, but ultimately you have to build an entire organization just to hold the accountability. And that's really what the government is designed to do, right? Is to hold all of the actors accountable to a process that benefits the people. And so when you start an affordable housing trust, you're going to have to have an organization that audits their budget, that looks at what they're spending their money on, that does, and, and again, not that those things are not possible, but I think the starting place is to really di dictate the story of your city, the story of your neighborhoods, and to start to put pressure on the person who ultimately is going to benefit from the existence of the Affordable Housing Trust. Because if the Affordable Housing Trust is managed by a mayor in a political patronage position, um, that affordable housing trust money is going to go through just like all of the other resources in the city to create jobs for that political machine that then allow it to use a nice affordable housing project to leverage the political power to continue the process. And we have to I start completely get it. Yeah. And they were trying to set up a committee to really let it go through. Um, but, you know, where I had an issue was, okay, so that's fine. We have these processes for these people that are actually going to get these benefits as far as the builders. 
But what about the um, homeowners that are supposed to get this money for repairs? What about the people that are supposed to actually get these, you know, subsidies or these, who's going to be accountable for them? No one. They don't care. The whole system. I know. That's what I'm worried. I'm worried. There's so many civic organizations that are aligned with me that are for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I don't know how I feel about it. That's why I wanted your opinion. I appreciate you. No, no, and I would love to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you to dig more and, and with anyone on this call uh, to dig more into this. And I would love to also come back and because uh, we have about five minutes left to kind of do a follow-up session. Uh, and I'll just say this. I think at this point, you know, um, I see so much potential in this group. It's it's really mind-blowing. I think really there's, there's a couple questions. How many neighborhoods do you have leaders in? Um, and what is a process to start using those leaders as anchors to build out more infrastructure in those neighborhoods? And the truth is so much of this has to do with where you have existing power and, and how efficiently you can start to build with more people uh, to get to the point where you can start to run campaigns. Uh, and those are difficult questions because to be honest, you know, I don't know if KUFA has the capacity to run campaigns everywhere in the city. Uh, so you all are gonna have to think about two things. What do you really want? Who has the power to get it? And where you have power right now and how to develop it. Uh, so again, these are all deep questions that you're gonna have to like marinate on. I'm happy to come back in a couple of weeks after you've had some conversations and think about power analysis and strategy moving forward. And I, I hope that, that some of this information and conversation has been helpful and, and clarifying and I'll leave it to, to Mary and Allison to kind of close us out. Yeah, thank you so much, John, for, I think you've given us a lot of things to think about. Um, and I think uh, the biggest takeaway really is um, being clear, you know, um, cause we've had, a we've got a lot of concerns in this group around housing issues. You know, we've got a lot of seniors who can't afford to maintain their homes, you know, and, and that's been a concern of this group. So there've been a lot of concerns, but I think the questions that you really put to us are, you know, what is our main focus? Where do we have power? Where, what can we mobilize? And I think those are the things that we probably need to, to think about the most. Um, so thank you so much. So I just wanna say our next housing meeting is gonna be on, December 15th at 6.30. And I will be uh, following up with each of you guys between now and then. Um, so we can do some one-on-ones and kind of digest some of this stuff. So does anybody have- Mary, that's um, third Tuesdays, right? So people- Right. Yeah. I just want to say I put my contact info in the chat. Great. Time again. All right. Does anybody okay. else have any parting thoughts? What time was the meeting again? 6.30. 6.30, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Comments, okay. jokes. All right. Thank you all so much. And thank you, John. Um, I think you've given us some stuff to, to chew on. I see Deb nodding her head over there. So, uh, well, can we have a little warm round of applause for John? Come off mute. <laughs> thank you, John. Yay. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. And and I will thank you. Come back when, when you all have a little more clarity and yeah, continue working with you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks. I got thank a lot. You, thank of you, it. thank you. Hopefully, we'll keep our heads up, keep praying our life, and continue to struggle.